Today we've got a crazy entitled parent who thinks a jacket is too provocative. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, my mom would rather see me homeless than take me home temporarily. So last year I graduated from university with a negative overdraft balance. I was in a very toxic relationship which isolated me from my friends and family, destroyed my mental health along with it. She would borrow a lot of money from me and I never got that back. I never had financial support and my student loan didn't cover enough to live and survive. So I was living off of my overdraft which has since declined massively. My ex-girlfriend was very abusive and she made several false R-word allegations against me. It crushed me and is ongoing. Since leaving university, my mom refuses to have me home for what seems very small reasons. Because I make too much noise or I wouldn't clean up after myself, etc. All things I did before university, which since I've grown up considerably. I've tried explaining that I'm not like that anymore, but she is not having it. For the past six months, I've been living with my aunt and uncle, who said I have to move out end of February. I had a temporary four-month job, which helped massively, but I had to buy new glasses, pay off other debts, and buy a phone, as the police have that. Since the contract expired, I've spent over two months looking for a more full-time job, which I am yet to find. I have no money, no place to live, and my mom would rather see me homeless than take me home, even if it was for one year. At home, I have a large support network and more available jobs, but my mom expects me to afford a place to live with no money. I have severe depression and anxiety as well as Asperger's. It's breaking my heart. My mom just doesn't care. Well, when OP does turn it around, not if, but when, they'll know exactly who was at least minorly there for them and who definitely was not there for them. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you can't get enough of hearing about these entitled parents, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is, Entitled Mom Thinks the Whole House is Her Hoarding Space. This is about my mother, who we'll call Ursula, from another story I plan to write here. However, as this one just happened, I'm filled with enough rage to put it to page. Please excuse the rhyme and the rest of my purple prose. I know it's a lot, but it keeps me from being too blue. And if you thought that was insufferable and pretentious, I'm sorry, but... Please stuff any comments about it up your, you know what. My mother is a hoarder. She's always been to an extent. For as long as I can remember, we've had the front room. A room so full of stuff you couldn't walk in it. I thought this was normal. I figured that my mom just had a lot of stuff. And she was making use of a room that wasn't otherwise utilized. There was a less explanation for her bedroom, which had a space carved out for her bed and a path to the bathroom, but... I didn't care about that. I mean, why would I? It was normal. It was the way things were. After all, we were the problem. My siblings and I, the three of us, we were miserable to live with. We never picked up after ourselves, never cleaned anything, never put anything back where it goes. Even though she told us millions of times, she doesn't ask for much. Only for us six-year-olds to stop being lazy and care about other people and respect her property for once. At least, that's what she would yell at us at least once a month for about 30 minutes to an hour. Also about how we were a huge drain on finances, we're lucky she doesn't make us clean the whole house, we're selfish and spoiled, etc, etc. Like I said, normal. She got worse throughout the years, with the abuse, yes, but also the hoarding. It was pretty gradual. The living room was very open, until the edges of the room slowly started expanding. The mass in her room gradually got higher and higher. The extra grocery bags overflowed from the Rubbermaid we'd put them in. It exploded when my grandfather died. He lived just down the street from us. My parents did the grueling work of taking care of him in the end, when his brain was swelling because of a chemo drug. They had only arranged for hospice nurses for a couple of months before he took his last breath in his house. A house two stories to our one that had a lot of stuff. A lot of cool stuff, mind. Batiks from his time in Singapore. Jade carvings he'd smuggled out of China. A collection of antique firearms. Wooden things he carved himself. The picture books he would read me as I sat on his lap as a kid. Though he had three children and though they took a good amount... There was still a lot of stuff left in the house. And because we lived minutes instead of hours away, all that stuff fell on us. You can see where I'm going with this, yeah? We filled up a storage shed. 
First into it went paintings and swords and a giant tortoise shell and wooden fruit and old old dolls and steins and my great grandmother's sewing box. Into it went cups and books and rock collections and Japanese prints and plates and furniture. Into it went our pastiche boxes I went out of my way to label clearly, so if we went spelunking we'd be able to find it. Just like the front room, there's no space to move in there. Any excavation jobs will have to move mountains of memories to get what you want. We have not gone back since. Before I knew it, the house was filled with more stuff. I can't even tell you what all came over. If you visited, I could probably point it out to you, but I know I would miss things. I could point to the china cabinets that were pushed into the kitchen. My mother promised me we could put our own cups and stuff in there. I predicted that it would be sealed up by stuff that would inevitably end up in the front of the doors. I'll let you guess who won that bet. I could point to my grandmother's sewing machine in the desk which held all of her thread and needles wrangled into the front room. My mother said that we could turn the front room into a sewing room. I knew that it would never be emptied for that, but I thought that a few square feet for me was within reach. I'll let you guess who won that bet. I'm looking at precarious stacks of flat jewelry boxes. Little compartments filled with the jewelry no one, including anyone in this house, picked out to keep when we'd laid it all out on my grandmother's bed. My mother told us a few months ago that she thinks my older aunt stole my grandmother's wedding ring. When she was sick in the hospital, she stole it from her finger into her purse and kept the secret more precious than its gold. The other day when my mother was driving me to the psychiatrist, she was wearing it and proudly told me she found where my grandfather had hidden it when his sunset was dawning. She said, Aunt thinks it belongs to her for some reason. I'll let you write the punchline to that one. It screwed me up so bad, especially at first. I would shake with anger and anxiety having to navigate around new permanent obstacles. I worked up the courage to ask my dad if we could get another storage space, and I was shot down because it was too expensive. So the beast has remained ever present. If I brush too close against it, it growls, and Ursula barks at me to be careful. That table was my great grandmother's, show it some respect. I need to care about other people's property for once in my life. Walking through the foyer is a dance. I have to turn my hips to weave between the less than one foot of space, arch my back to avoid cardboard boxes hitting me in the face, Part of the reorganization of the house, when the new stuff came in, was her moving things into the playroom. Nothing big behind the name, it was just the room we would play in when me and my siblings were small. Still where a lot of toys are, but also home to art supplies, my makeup, a sofa we moved in here forever ago, a bed pressed against the corner moved in before that forever, when they tried giving my sister her own room but it didn't stick. It kind of became my space, though it was for the three of us. My brother used it some, my sister not really at all. I used it about every day, in high school and college to do homework, in college and past to have a space to myself. It was the only room I had with a door that I didn't piss in. The three of our bedrooms hadn't had the door closed for years. Besides, the bedroom's not just my space, I'd feel bad about closing them out like that. The first scratch after my grandfather's death was three big rubber maids full of clothes I picked out from my grandparents' closet to go through and either wear or alter with my new inherited sewing machine. Not ideal, but my own thing, and I knew I would get to it eventually. While I tried to be somewhat mercenary in my choosing, I knew that I kept too much out of grief, and when I could smell their detergent without crying again, I would probably be able to get it down to just one that would be eroded by scavenging it for parts. Then, without warning, a couple pieces of furniture, a rocking chair and shoe, cubby, thing, that takes up a few more precious square feet. Upsetting. I hated it. But Ursula promised with a sheepish smile that it was temporary. Just until she figured out where else to put it. I could no longer reach the back of my room. Couldn't get to the blank canvases or where I put my jewelry box. But it was fine. I hadn't gone through my rubber maids yet, but I could climb over stuff, shimmy around. There were band-aids for this cut. It hurt to touch, but I wasn't yet bleeding out. The rest of the horde dripped in slowly. The surrounding area became puffy and tender. A three-foot-high thing of wrapping paper. The aforementioned jewelry flats. Some backpacks she bought online all crept on top of our things. 
The wrapping paper in front of the colored pencils, the jewelry on top of the paints, the backpacks on top of the fabric bolts I was able to scavenge. I knew it was septic a couple months ago, when my mother cleaned things a bit, reorganizing so my crap was below, inaccessible, unless I wanted to pull things out and put them away. To be clear, there is no way to do this correctly. Even if I did it to her satisfaction, there's no way to do it without pulling the trigger in a game of emotional roulette that only seems to shoot all the well-being out of my brain, never hers. For December, I couldn't look at it. Boxes, gift-filled pus oozed from the door, swallowing whatever sanctuary had remained. The door wouldn't close because a box was in the way. I would shake thinking about it. Every time I passed the door, anger and anxiety held my hands. My hard-won certainty in their existence and their assertion that this was not right. The only thing I had near solace. The packages kept showing up. She has a shopping addiction, but that's another post. And I was left in nothing but my shock. I asked her a day or so ago, after much deliberation of wording and timing the alignment of the stars, if I could collapse the cardboard boxes in the playroom. She agreed. Today, she asked if I wanted to get into the playroom. I told her honestly, no pretension, not even trying to hide myself. Having all that stuff in there is honestly distressing. She didn't like that. She sealed up her chocolate almonds, moving her head in the arc that meant that she was about to get into it. This is her house. This is her space. She's tired of dealing with us. She doesn't cater to our mental... mental quirks. We can't come in here and control her space. Well, if we're talking your space versus ours, the playroom is kinda ours. She's sorry, but this is not my house just because we grew up here. This is daddy's and her house. And she's tired of living in an emotional dead zone where she's not allowed to get angry. I don't even pick up after myself anyway. She will not be controlled like this. She read the six steps to being a better person and it made her cry. Number one was be more empathetic. I've told you, if you say I'm not empathetic, the conversation is over. She didn't say that. I always just shut down. I didn't even try to hear her out. You don't have to read that last paragraph. It's abusive nonsense. I left instead of listening to it. My sister tried to bodily block me from getting into the bathroom. Then when I slipped into the playroom, a packing peanut-filled scab that flaked from the hole kept me from closing the door. She pushed it open. I shouldered against her. She pried my hand off the door jam. I put it back. After she was talked away by my parents, both of them, not just the mother that snake charmed her, she let me inside. I told her before I closed it, if you want us to be closer, this isn't the way to do it. She responded, we've already tried everything else. I swallowed my, really? Everything else? Everything else. You have literally tried everything but hurting me. Have you tried treating me like a person and respecting my space? I hate what Ursula's done to you. She turned you into this sycophant, into someone who would actively participate and perpetuate abuse. I hate what she's done to you and at this point I freaking hate you too. I love you. I can't be around you. I cannot be around you. I cannot be around you. And I just closed the door locking it behind me. Don't worry though, she made sure to tell me through the door that all I do is hurt other people. Don't worry though, she wasn't out there for too long. My mom came by as she was saying crap and told her that there's no use talking to me. I'm a selfish person who does whatever I want and don't care about who I hurt in the process. I've been sitting in this room for hours now, at the newest outbreak site writing this. My phone's on 4% now and I smell my dad making dinner. I heard Ursula hug and thank him for the first time in years after I locked myself up, after I heard them laughing without me, after she hurled abuse at them too. My last therapist once told me, hoarding is an inappropriate expression of grief. It's the inability to let things go, the manifestation of the ghosts that haunt your head all day and night. It's the obsession made physical, making moves to devour you from the outside in. I empathize with her grief. I empathize with the anxiety, the depression, the neurodivergency, the OCD she all passed down to me. I know life was not easy for Ursula. I know she's a victim herself. I know pulling her tentacles off my heart hurts her. 
I've despaired at the picture of her going the way so many hoarders do, crushed beneath their collected crap, suffocated not by the metaphor, but the useful and useless, and sentimental and meaningless, blended into stuff, pressing so hard down on them they suffocate, or worse, do not. But I cannot live like this. If I'm going to be trapped here, I will have a room that locks. I'll sleep in my closet, dance through the foyer, suck it up when more and more packages arrive at our doorstep. But I will not let her have this space too. I don't know how I'll do it, but it won't happen. I won't let it. She's never wanted pictures of our house online. I never really understood why. I guessed it was just privacy. I know now. Screw her. I'm sitting amongst the beast now, and the shortness of my breath is not anxiety, but anger. Some of what you see is mine, but that's not a caveat, not iodine to her wounds. It's so you may be able to recognize some of me in the horde. I don't have to erase all traces of myself from my space, because she's invaded it. I feel you looming over me. Here I am, growling back. For a bit of levity, and because I don't have a better place to put it, we have three ottomans. Three, and they aren't like footrests either. One's about a foot and a half wide and a little over a meter long. One is like two and a half by four feet. The other one's like four by two. Disclaimer that I'm terrible at estimating dimensions. Three, three Ottomans. It sounds like the punchline to a racially insensitive joke from the 40s. I just picture some guy with a fedora and that baseball announcer voice. Say, Lou, you know how to get rid of 18 peanuts? Three Ottomans! Like, why it's funny is buried under so many layers of depreciated stereotypes you'd have to pull up at least three Wikipedia articles to get it fully. And even then, getting it would just make you pull a face like, ugh, and close the tab feeling kinda gross. I don't know why this fact tickles me so much. I guess it's just such a tangible number of absurdities. Why in God's name would anyone on the planet need three Ottomans? Maybe if you're a rich person with rich person taste, i.e. none, and have a gigantic room with 18 chairs and a dining table and a conversation table and a fire pit and a fireplace, very different, and five sofas and a dedicated phone line from one end to the other, because you tried screaming at your maid once because she thought you saw a line of dust she overlooked, but she couldn't understand you because the room was too big and echoey, maybe then I can see three or four ottomans. But three ottomans for our square footage is like, a little excessive I think. Just like, I honestly don't know. Just my intuition I guess. OP attached some pictures of this house and it is pretty darn crowded. The one consolation I have to say is at least it doesn't look like grody. I've seen some videos on hoarder houses and a lot of times they look rancid. I wouldn't even be worried about her getting crushed by her stuff or whatever. I would be worried if there's a fire that breaks out, a room that is overflowing with cardboard, the whole place is going down and god forbid you need to get out of there quick, that fire is just about getting to the front door faster than you are. This next story is, why am I responsible for her health? It's not even that big of a deal, but I'm so annoyed. I'm on vacation with my narcissistic mom, just the two of us. In the past two weeks, my dad's woken me up six times to tell her to eat because she wasn't responding to her blood sugar alarm or him calling her three plus times. She's almost 60. Get your crap together. I'm tired of losing sleep because you're not being responsible for a condition you've had for 15 years now. And then I'm an idiot who gets told to not put a metal spoon in the microwave. Which is it? Am I incompetent or expected to save your life? Extra frustrating that the only medical help I've asked her for since becoming an adult, and her telling me to figure it out myself because I'm an adult, is taking me to and from procedures where they won't let me drive myself, which she did, and asking her to help make sure I take my meds when I've been in especially low places, which she hasn't done once. Why do I always feel like the mom? Why can't I have a mom? You just gotta love parents that see you as nothing more but like an able-bodied worker. Almost just like you're contracted out for 18 years and see ya after that. Our next story is, Entitled Mother Mad I Won't Waste My Time On Her Needs. My entitled mother went to the hospital last night, the second time this week. I found out because my grandmother called in, which I hear my aunt in the background saying, she said not to tell anyone. 
Like I said, this is the second time this week. She does have pneumonia, but they sent her home with an antibiotic two days ago that she refused to even try getting on her own and expects me to just stop what I'm doing, get the medicine, and deliver it to her. I have three children, a full-time job, and no actual car of my own. My husband and I share one. So she calls me from the emergency room and very clearly has an attitude with me because earlier in the day I wouldn't come get her money, go into town, and return with the food she wanted. She blamed my husband for not letting me use the car. I didn't talk to her anymore until she called me from the hospital. She made snarky comments about not calling back because the nurses would expect me to come get her. My mother can get a free ride home through her insurance. She just doesn't want to, but still not the point of the story. She called me and asked me to check her medical chart online, which I tried to do, but she didn't know the password, so I couldn't. I asked her why she wouldn't just ask the nurse, and she gave me no answer anything. I could have seen a nurse who Entitled Mother was physically with who would have instant access to. She hung up on me angry when I wouldn't call her sister and try to talk her through logging on from the home computer. Again, all she had to do was ask a nurse. Now it's the next day and she's home having people call me to bring food and she'll give me five dollars. Five dollars doesn't cover the gas to get there. Not to mention there's food in the house and two other people. Just none of them want to clean anything to be able to cook, or what they have Entitled Mother doesn't want. I help Entitled Mother as much as I can, but it seems like when I give an inch, she doesn't appreciate it and wants a mile. Her requests have become more ridiculous, and I'm the bad person for being busy or simply unable. It's probably time to hit the block button for a while. This next story is, so she is dead. My mother passed right after New Year that I had no contact with for 20 years. The no contact was her choice, which is an oddity in this form, or at least not talked about as much. The saying goes that it starts slowly and happens all at once. Turns out it was true. First, I got a call from the spouse of a family member, telling me she was hospitalized with her health failing, and this may be my last chance to see her. Then, 30 minutes later, I got a text that she was gone. She got laid to rest not even two days later, and I was asked if I was attending the service the night before. I live far enough away that had I drove straight there, I would have missed the service anyway. My only closure came a week later at graveside, saying my piece before leaving. I'll go ahead and introduce her. She was self-serving, hedonistic, considered themselves the smartest person in the room, had expert knowledge of any and all subjects, a vicious gossip, and very lazy. She stole from her own children and extended family. The most personal slight to me was in the form of Amex, Visa, and Discover cards open in my name, leaving me about $18,000 in the hole at 18 years old. I had trusted in her for a couple of years and attempted to have her make it right. The very last conversation I ever had with her was her assurance that you can't get blood from a stone, and while that may be true, it didn't stop Amex from trying its very best. She was moving around and changing her number every so often until I got the point and stopped trying. It was a wild thing for her to do given that she grew up a single child in a family that, by conventional means, would be considered upper middle class wealthy. It was much later that I found out she burned through the whatever her parents and grandparents had accumulated and then started exploiting her own kids. She blew through around 2 million in wealth, by my known estimations on assets I knew about, when her own mother passed. She was the sole inheritor. It was right before we stopped talking. She dropped the youngest siblings with me while she went off to go do some darn thing I don't remember because that's when I found out my siblings were illiterate. I had the luxury of a high school education. They were homeschooled, which turns out she was too lazy to do coursework with them. I should have called the cops. I should have called CPS. I just didn't know any better at the time. Thankfully, I had an aunt and uncle who did know what to do. So there I was at her graveside, asking her questions she could no longer answer. Not like she ever wanted to answer. Did she spend her final moments thinking how she got away with it all? Not having to accept responsibility for her choices? Did she get to own all the things she wanted? No regrets? She never cared for her own health. Untreated diabetes because managing it was too much work didn't manage her diet because we all die eventually. 
She also didn't believe in vaccines either, saying the experts were wrong. It was pneumonia brought on by COVID that got her in the end. So my final question was, do you believe in the experts now? I mean, they're the kind of person that if they could respond from beyond the grave, they would quadruple down. That's just how it sounds to me. Our next story is, Entitled Mother Tells Me to Change My Jacket Because It's Too Tight. So yesterday, I decided to go ice skating with a friend. After skating around for a little bit, I noticed this one kid kept looking at me. Kind of weird, but okay. After skating around for a little longer, I noticed this one lady staring daggers at me, so I decided stupidly to go over. I said, excuse me ma'am, why are you staring at me? She says, why the heck are you dressed like that? This is a park. I said, I know. She says, why is your jacket so tight? Why do you want to show off your chest so badly? I said, what? She said, change your jacket. You're going to give my child evil thoughts. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, as was myself, why haven't I left yet? The answer, I'm too stubborn. I said, I think I'm dressed appropriately. It seems like your problem if me wearing a jacket makes your son interested. She says, he's a good Christian kid and shouldn't be near slots like you. I said, he's like 15. Sexual thoughts are normal for his age. She said, he's... I say, so what exactly do you want me to do? She says, just take off that jacket. I say, your wish is my command. I took off my jacket and tossed it to her, which she realized I was only wearing a sports bra. I said, so does this make you... She said, you little witch, I meant change your jacket. I said, I'm supposed that's the first time you've interrupted me. People like you don't usually do that. She says, what do you mean people like you? I say, witches. Can I have my jacket back now? At this point, my completely socially unaware friend came over. My friend seemed to realize this was an argument, so he decided to not speak in English. The friend in Japanese said, It's below freezing, why are you in your bra? I reply in Japanese, This lady decided my jacket was too sexy for her son. She says, What the heck are you saying about me? I said, That you're a witch. It finally came to my dumb butt brain that I can just... leave? So I did. I snatched my jacket back and left to ice skate. The kid came to apologize but could barely get a word out. I mean, even if a jacket was figure fitting, I don't see where you could ever get off telling somebody to change their jacket because it's too provocative. I mean, I guess maybe if it was made of clear plastic. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy entitled parent story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.